Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ninth mask seminar and the first one of 2021. Uh, people are still joining, so I'm going to start very slowly on my introductory remarks whilst whilst everybody enters. But um, firstly, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Nikki Cullum and I'm director of the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration or ARC for Greater Manchester. And I'm particularly excited to be um, introducing this seminar because this is something of an ARC seminar, our first one in a way. So our ARC is one of 15 applied research collaborations funded by NIHR across England. And we are funded to co-produce applied health research in areas that um, are deemed important to meet the needs of lo the local population and the local health and care system. So in our case, uh, that of Greater Manchester. So you're going to start, I hope, to get a flavour of the kinds of things that we do in the ARC in Greater Manchester in this seminar. And, and I hope there'll be other ARC seminars in this series in the future where you'll be able to learn, to learn more about what we do. But I'm going to introduce our two speakers for the day now. Um, we've got two speakers, each of whom are going to speak for about 20 minutes. And we're going to make sure there's plenty of time for lively discussion at the end about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Um, so I'm going to introduce both speakers now and then they're going to hand over the baton from one to the other seamlessly in the middle. We're going to take all our questions at the end of more of that in a, in a moment. Um, so Paul Wilson is going to be our first speaker. So Paul is a senior lecturer in the Centre for Primary Care and Health Services Research here at the University of Manchester. Uh, and he is the implementation science theme lead of our NIHR ARC for Greater Manchester. So Paul has a background in evidence synthesis and previously worked uh, in the University of York at the Centre for Reviews and Dissemination, where he was responsible for translating the findings of systematic reviews into formats for use by a wide range of professional audiences. Sorry, how long, have I, how, how long was I muted then? Did it, did it just mute? It was momentary. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, that was a bit weird. I didn't do that. I mean, somebody's out to get me. The problem is I spoke for far too long. So, um, so Paul, Paul's research is very much focused on how do we use research evidence in decision making, in policy and in practice, and how do we develop... Um, and evaluate methods to increase the uptake of research findings into practice. That, in essence, is implementation science, as we'll hear. And he's currently working on various projects, apart from the ARC, including the uh, evaluation of the um, implementation of the NHS Diabetes Implementation Program, uh, Diabetes Prevention Program. Paul is also, is, I tell you, this introduction is longer than his talk, it's going to be. Uh, Paul is also <laughs> co-editor-in-chief of Implementation Science, which is the top international journal for implementation research, with a very high impact factor that I'm not going to read out. And then our second speaker is Dr. Roman Kisloff. Roman is a reader in organisation studies at Manchester Metropolitan University, and he's our deputy theme leader for um, implementation science in the ARC. Um, Paul, um, Roman, sorry, conducts qualitative research on the processes and practices of implementation across disciplinary boundaries, looking, but you know, using both organisational studies, lenses, pol public administration and health service research approaches. And prior, he's got, Roman's got a very interesting background, prior to pursuing an academic career, Roman worked as a doctor for a gold mining company in Central Asia, combining clinical work with a managerial role. So Paul's going to set the scene for us by introducing the topic of implementation science and where it sits in the research landscape and what the, what the whole of implementation science encompasses in a, in a broad sense. And then Roman will begin to drill down a bit, which is quite appropriate for somebody who used to be in gold mining. He will drill down and introduce us to some of the key theories, frameworks and approaches for bridging the knowledge implementation gap. 
So I'm going to shut up now. You'd be very pleased to hear. Um, if you can all keep your microphones and videos off until Roman, who's the second speaker, has finished. And at that point, by all means, switch your videos on, keep your microphones off, but keep switch your videos on because we want to make this as human as in, and as interactive and engaging as we possibly can via Zoom. Now, there are three ways of asking questions by raising your electronic hand at the end. Uh, and that's in your re reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, by putting questions in the chat at any point, uh, and I will I'll relay them or by sending an email, um, which you'll have probably seen, I think at some point to MA, uh, mask seminars, all one word at healthinnovationmanchester.com and we can take them by email because we're hoping for lots of discussion at the end. So that's enough from me. I'm without further ado, going to hand over to Paul to begin the session. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Nikki. Um, I'll not introduce myself because that was a very long introduction for, for me, so thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of implementation science, what it is, the nature of the field and some of the developments that uh, are uh, currently happening amongst those of us who uh, are, are active in this discipline. So just to uh, get going, some of you might wonder what is this implementation science and why is it called implementation science? And uh, indeed, uh, we often see some quite derogatory terms attached to it in terms of the so-called bit at the front. So is it a science? Uh, definitely not. It's applied health services research that's very much focused on a particular set of questions related to the implementation of research-based knowledge into practice and policy. Uh, the implementation science bit comes from the foundation of the journal which I edit, which is back in 2005. And if you were to search in PubMed, you wouldn't find um, much uh, indication of that term being used at all uh, prior to that date. So what, although the term is a marketing concept come up by our publishers to sort of explain, it's actually very useful as an umbrella term to describe a particular field with a particular focus. Um, implementation issues existed before the journal, and I'm just going to pick out two sort of historical drivers of a lot of the activity in the field today, just to give you a, a, a sense of where it's all derived from. So I'm going back to the 1950s. Um, some of you will be already aware of the diffusion of innovations theory, so how ideas uh, get taken up and spread in social systems. And uh, a lot of that early work was done in the 1940s in, by sociologists working in um, fields like agriculture. And what we saw in the 1950s, though, was medical sociologists getting interested. And this study is really one of the seminal studies in the field. It was actually funded by Pfizer, believe it or not. And uh, Pfizer were interested in knowing whether um, their advertising supplements that were included in JAMA uh, were hitting the mark and uh, having an influence on uh, practices. But the study actually looks at it at a much broader scope. The context is the introduction of tetracycline or a version of tetracycline that uh, uh, Pfizer was promoting uh, within, with, with, within the um, family uh, practice uh, environment in the, in the States. So it's uh, family practitioners, so the equivalent of GPs that this uh, um, study was targeted at. And essentially what we have is this graph on the right hand side which uh, shows you the interconnectedness of doctors and their uh, adoption of uh, tetracycline. So uh, the thick bold line that's at the top is um, those who were well connected with their peers, they were much faster to adopt than those doctors who were relatively isolated, maybe working in single, single practices or in more rural settings. Uh, and uh, the researchers looked at the reasons for why that was. Um, now, they saw the importance of social networks, which has always been and still is a driving force in understanding how we bring about change in uh, healthcare systems. Um, but later analysis that they did focus more in on things that have become constituent strategies within the implementation landscape looking at the role of persuasive communications, looking at the role of opinion leaders, 
and also uh, academic detailing, so pharmaceutical marketing, the reps going in and uh, providing information to um, uh, the family physicians in this in this context. So this really was a seminal study in terms of setting out some of the ways that we think about how do we bring about change and how can we influence the uptake of interventions and innovations in practice settings. So moving forward in time a little bit, and this really is um, reflecting the, the rise in evidence-based uh, medicine in the 1980s and early 90s. And uh, what we saw then was our ability to synthesize and codify research-based knowledge into clinical practice guidelines to sort of give recommendations of best practice really accelerated in this, uh, in this period. Um, quite soon after we began to, the production of you know, guideline development processes began to expand across the world, people realized that um, just uh, synthesizing knowledge in this way didn't mean that those recommendations were taken up and acted upon in practice settings. And lots of researchers around the, uh, the, the globe, notably people like uh, Stephen Sumerai and Stephen Wolfe in the States, Jonathan Lomas in, in Canada, Richard Gall and Michelle Wensing in the Netherlands, and in the UK, people like Jeremy Grimshaw and Ian Russell were all interested in, well, how, how can we get these recommendations taken up and used in practice? How do we improve practice by uh, getting uh, uh, health professionals to adhere to guideline recommendations. And on the back of that, a lot of uh, focus on guideline recommendation uptake, designing style uh, strategies and, uh, and trials that would investigate and explore ways in which we could do that efficiently and effectively. Uh, a lot of that was synthesized at the time in the 1990s through the Effective Healthcare series that, you know, uh, that was produced by the Centre for Reduce and Dissemination York, at uh, York, and I was heavily involved in that. But also one of the early uh, review groups of the Cochrane collaboration was actually focused on bringing about change in practice and the, the EPOC group, the Effective Practice and Organisation of Care, was one of the very early review groups to be founded and is still uh, very active and, uh, and very influential in the field today. So that's just a very quick potted history uh, in terms of some of the key drivers of why we see implementation science in its shape or form today ultimately people have always been interested in unwarranted variation in practice and how we can bring about improvements in that space. Just, uh, moving on, just getting my slides stuck there. So here's uh, what it is. So what is implementation science as we understand it uh, as, a, as a discipline? Well, it's very much focused on methods to promote the systematic uptake of evidence-based interventions, practices and policies, ways of working within a within a healthcare and, and care system. Um, it does include a, a large portion of it and a hugely influential part, which overlaps with a lot of what goes on in psychology and behavioral sciences about the study of influences on behavior. So patient behavior, professional behavior, primarily in implementation science, but also organizational behaviors. And this is an area where Roman specializes. Uh, increasingly, there's a focus on uh, de-implementation so as well as looking at uh, methods to promote uptake of things we know work, we're also interested in stopping people doing things that we know don't work or provide low or no clinical benefit. Um, so reducing, replacing or restricting activity in that space is an increasing area of investigation within the field. Just to focus in on the evidence-based element. So we're interested in things that, that work or don't work. And that means in terms of a research development pathway, we're always at the right hand side. We are the second translational gap uh, is where most of the uh, implementation science activity exists. So things that we know work that already have an established, uh, have a, had an effectiveness established in some shape or form, uh, maybe been recommended through uh, appraisal processes, be that nice or elsewhere in the world. Um, so looking to accelerate their uptake into practice settings or as, uh, or as part of policy implementation activity. And the focus of the field is really in sort of four broad areas as a consequence. That was sort of alluded to in that last graph on the bottom, on the top right hand side. But essentially, we're interested in four things. So we're interested in exploring systems, behaviours and practices that can act as barriers or facilitators to change processes. So understanding the context in which changes to occur and using that information to design rigorous strategies that seek to address those barriers and enablers in some shape or form to deliver a faster uptake 
and improved outcomes ultimately for uh, uh, for health. Uh, that rigorous evaluation very much focuses on trials. Uh, trials are the mainstay of implementation science uh, in terms of the evaluation of uh, implementation strategies. Cluster trials, we tend to randomize groups, uh, practices, hospital wards, hospitals themselves or regions rather than individuals. Uh, alongside that, there has been an explosion in the last, um, I would say, the last five years at least anyway, in terms of understanding the processes of implementation uh, itself. And I'll settle a little bit, bit, bit that in a, in, a, in a moment. But um, knowing just something works, so doing a strategy, evaluating that strategy and getting an effectiveness outcome is not enough. We actually not have to know what happened in, in that space and what were the active ingredients, the active components within that. Driving all those three areas is um, theory. And theory is really one of the, the key contributions, I think, that the implementation science is making to uh, applied health research generally, in that uh, we use theory routinely in all of those uh, elements in terms of exploring, designing, and evaluating. Uh, and we're using theory to both advance our knowledge and understanding of how uh, change can occur in a given social system. So in terms of the strategies that have been developed, we, um, there are a wide range of strategies that have uh, been subject to rigorous evaluation. Just taking the very top one on this slide, audit and feedback, there are some 200 trials evaluating the effectiveness of audit and feedback interventions that have been undertaken globally. Um, the same applies across the board. Uh, a number of these uh, studies have been uh, conducted in the last 20 years, but a lot of it does exist prior to the sort of real growth of implementation science in the 2000s and this century. So there was a lot of activity in the 90s in these areas that may not have been necessarily uh, described in the way that we do now. And one of the things that a key feature of the historical literature uh, when it comes to knowing about which strategies work in which uh, contexts is that a lot of the original studies were poorly conceived with uh, little thought given to um, uh, what behaviours or processes needed to uh, be targeted for change to occur. That seems a fairly fundamental um, uh, missing link in a lot of the activity. Uh, and whether the strategy that was employed could actually address the things that, uh, that mattered. So if you were de designing a be behaviour change strategy that didn't um, target the behaviours that needed to change, then uh, uh, some of the issues around um, non-effectiveness uh, uh, could be uh, explained uh, away in that sense. Um, the other big problem that we had was not just that um, there was not a lot, a lot of thought that went into uh, the, the conception of these strategies, uh, they were also inconsistently and poorly described. So audit and feedback has a lot of moving parts. Facilitation, which Roman will uh, allude to in his uh, talk, is another one where there's a a lot of active ingredients going on there so knowing what people actually did to bring about change or if they weren't successful what happened as a result of their their activities this information is often lacking or was historically lacking in the literature there's been a big push to improve the reporting of implementation studies in the last five years. So what we're trying to do now is leave ISLAGAT. And ISLAGAT is a term that was first, uh, I heard, used by the founding editor of implementation science, Mark Nichols. And it stands for, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And we're trying to move away from doing things that seem like a good idea at the time to taking a more systematic and structured approach that's theoretically driven to deliver change in practice settings. Some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, I've just used it because uh, drawing it myself would be too, uh, too onerous a task, but this is the MRC framework for uh, process evaluations. And as I said, we're very interested in the process of implementation and what happens. And if you look at the gray box on the left-hand side of the screen, where it says description of intervention, if you just change that to strategies, we're looking at the same thing. So in terms of uh, implementation science now, tends to focus on understanding that or that context in which change is to occur, identifying the barriers and enablers, designing strategies, and then following how those get rolled out in practice. So understanding whether they're delivered as intended, whether there's adaptation, 
and whether they can still link to the mechanisms that we've uh, anticipated being the drivers of the outcomes that we want to see. So this slide actually, I think, uh, describes implementation science uh, quite succinctly and gives you a feel for the complexity of some of the designs that we're uh, delivering now. So I focused on the right hand side of the pathway with things that we know work or things that we clearly know don't work and we shouldn't be doing. Um, but there's growing interest on the left hand side of the pathway. So looking at um, efficacy and effectiveness research and increasingly implementation scientists have been pulled and asked to get involved in projects and uh, to consider implementation earlier in the research development pathway. Now that's a good thing. And here's well, just an example from Manchester and this is uh, funded by NIHRI for I, involves the BRC and it's led by Bill Newman, who I'm sure a lot of you know from genomic medicine. Um, it's the PALO study, and this is a feasibility and context study looking at a novel point of care genetic test, which is designed to detect uh, neonates risk of uh, antibiotic uh, induced hearing loss. You know, so people who are at risk of sepsis who uh, get admitted into a NICU have to give, be given antibiotics in a certain time frame. There's a particular antibiotic that can cause deafness, this point of care test seeks to identify those babies and save uh, uh, the, the costs and morbidity that uh, uh, can be derived from that uh, down the line. The implementation aspect in this is using implementation science methods to focus on the feasibility and acceptability of delivery. Can we drop this point of care test? into an established clinical care pathway where there is a, a, a routinized way of working uh, and uh, disrupt that in a way that doesn't disrupt the overall care that's delivered. And if we can, and if it's acceptable to those who have to be trained to do it, um, can we roll that out elsewhere? So that's what the implementation science focuses on in, 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 in this study. So as well as uh, looking at barriers and enablers to change as, as this study is, we're also looking at the methods to promote more rapid translation of research. So this blurring the efficacy effect this implementation boundaries. So traditionally trials have been done quite se sequentially and now we're seeing uh, methods being developed to allow us to do them concurrently. And uh, the, the three uh, bullets that are presented here are three different types of hybrid design. So these are trials that are designed to test to do dual testing of clinical outcomes and implementation outcomes at the same time. So the first one's very much focused on clinical, the gathering information uh, on implementation processes. So that's very much pragmatic trial with process evaluation attached in a more lay terms. Type two in the middle is a very complicated double trial essentially. So you've got dual testing of the clinical interventions. Uh, and you've also got dual testing of the implementation strategies. And then the final one is more towards the traditional implementation science, which is testing the strategy, but you might gather additional information about clinical benefits uh, as you go along. Uh, the type one is one that we're about to try uh, test. We're working with uh, Northwest eHealth, Novartis and Health Innovation Manchester to deliver a, 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 a trial of a cholesterol lowering drug in Greater Manchester in the spring. So that would be the first time that we've ever done a hybrid in, in, in this part of the, the world. They're very popular in the, in the United States where they were initially developed by the Veterans Administration who were conscious that uh, change took too long to occur they wanted to introduce services much quicker and have to divide rigorous methods of evaluation to do just that. So I'm conscious of time and I'm just going to finish off with a, <coughs> excuse me, a, a quick summary saying there's global, growing global interest in bringing about change in health systems. The UK is not alone in this. It's very large activity in uh, North America. And if you look at the uh, NIH, NIH funding uh, programs, a lot of it is geared to implementation and dissemination research. It's inherently disciplinary. I'm a social scientist by trade. Roman's uh, 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 an organizational scientist, they're psychologists, health economists, uh, all across the applied health uh, research spectrum as well as clinical academics. <clears throat> and what we're looking to do is provide 
uh, rigorous evaluation and methods that are focused around a particular set of questions which are focused on bringing about change in practice. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. That timing was perfect. So thank you. Lots of points for you. Uh, we're going to hand seamlessly over now to Roman to do the second talk. And as I said at the beginning, keep thinking of questions, putting them in the chat or be prepared to verbalise them at the end. Thanks very much. OK, hello, everyone. And thanks, Paul, for a lovely introduction. Uh, I think I will draw a lot on what you said because there, there is a lot of connectivity. Uh, I think what I will be focusing is not a uh, research side of implementation science. It's more about how can you use implementation science if you are not an implementation researcher? Maybe you're researching a different field. So I will be talking less about methods of building high quality implementation research. I will be mostly talking about the application of methods, theories, frameworks that already exist. So Paul mentioned second translational gap. This is a picture. Maybe it's over dramatic, but very, very often people do perceive that as a gap. On the one hand, you have evidence, research, knowledge, guidelines, and on the other hand, you have clinical practice and they're not necessarily connected. So and very often people uh, who try to bridge the gap, they feel a little bit like this. And here comes implementation science, which potentially can play a role of a bridge. But I deliberately have a question mark here. And maybe by the end of the talk, will have a little bit more nuanced interpretation of the metaphor of a bridge. But I will structure my talk around two main components. First, I will give you some flavor of what theories, models, and frameworks used in implementation science can do and what they can't do. And then the second component will be to give you an, um, an example of an implementation strategy. I will be focusing on facilitation and my my purpose is not to teach you how you can use different models or strategies. It's more to give you a flavor of what the field can offer and what the complexity is. Okay, and before I will start with theory. As Paul mentioned, implementation science is probably quite distinct from other fields within health services research because it is quite theoretical. And I often find it when I speak to uh, non-theory minded people that I need to give a little bit of advocacy why theories, models and frameworks are important. So just one introductory slide on that. Theory is basically an accumulation, a crystallization of previous knowledge. Very often this knowledge is coincide, structured, systematic and most importantly generalizable from one context to a broad range of contexts. Theory is not opposed to practice. I constantly keep emphasizing that. It's not something fundamentally different. Basically, theory is a way, uh, a scientific way of talking about actual day-to-day -day practice. So in the context of implementation science, what can theory help us do? Uh, I like this matter of diagnosing the context of implementation, identifying the enablers and the barriers. Other things that implementation science can potentially help us with is to uh, suggest ways. Suggest is a very important word here, not prescribe. Just suggest some ways of addressing implementation barriers by thinking about what processual steps you can take and also, very importantly, thinking about mechanisms of change. Also, if you use multiple theories, you may be able to look at the same phenomenon or its components from different angles, and for the research mind is amongst you, of course, as a science, implementation science theories are capable of generating uh, hypotheses and propositions for future research. In my very short talk, I will be mostly talking about um, theories that help you identify barriers, professional steps and mechanisms of change. I don't have time to talk at length about how you can eliminate the phenomenon from multiple perspectives or about generating hypotheses. This is beyond the scope of my talk. So I will show you an example of a theory that mostly looks at barriers and enables. I will show you an example of theory that talks about processes of change. I will show you a very complicated theory talking about mechanisms. But while I'm talking about those, please keep in mind that theory is not to give you prescriptions. It's only to guide your thinking about how you might want to 
implement things or research the implementation of things. Okay, now three theories or frameworks or models. I don't want to talk about the differences. It's a debate topic, but this is an example of a framework that mostly looks at enablers and facilitators of change. This is called Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. It's extremely popular. And this is an example of a determinant framework. What does it mean? The main purpose of determinant frameworks is to alert you to a very broad range of components or elements or things. They need to be taken into account when you plan, design, implement, or evaluate an implementation strategy or intervention. If you look at the picture, you will see that there are multiple components here, as is very typical for this type of frameworks. And you have to pay attention to the evidence uh, base itself, to the inner context, to the outer context, which is broader than your department or organization. Or of course, you have to look at different characteristics of users, uh, stakeholders, professionals, and other stakeholders. And this framework gives you an indication that implementation is a process and it has multiple changes. So in determinant framework, they list components. This is their strength because they give you a breadth of coverage and almost a checklist that you can tick. Uh, if a certain characteristic, a characteristic is present, this is an enabler. If a certain thing is missing, that's a barrier. The disadvantages of using frameworks like this is that once you identify enablers and barriers, it doesn't tell you what you're going to do and how to make sure that those barriers are overcome. For that, you need some other approaches or thinking. So this is a determinant framework. And now we are going to knowledge to action cycle, which is a processual model. So here, it doesn't tell you how and uh, in what way to focus on enablers or barriers. This is not a purpose of process frameworks. Here, the main purpose is to show what processual steps need to be taken account. Uh, and very importantly, here, again, you see the step on the left, assessing barriers and facilitators for change. Then, as Paul already alluded to, selection, tailoring those uh, tailoring strategies to certain barriers and fertile facilitators is very important. The importance of monitoring and evaluation is very important. Uh, uh, and then uh, the whole thing is a very neat, nice, idealized implementation process, which is much more messy and doesn't necessarily happen in this exact sequence in real life. What I like about models like this is that they constantly emphasize that it's not just about starting an implementation, starting the implementing of a certain set and stone intervention. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of emphasis is on tailoring to context and also on sustainability. What will happen to your intervention once your resources are over and you are out of the field? Will it still be implementable and sustained over time? And of course, as Paul said, implementation can sometimes finish by de-implementing because whatever you implemented in the first instance is no longer relevant. So although you always try to implement a certain thing, you almost have to plan for what you will do after this thing is no longer needed because the evidence, the evidence base, for example, has changed since then. The disadvantages of using those frameworks, as I said, in process models, you don't have a list of um, contextual barriers to enablers. You have to identify them yourself. And also, although you know that you need to tailor things, it doesn't tell you how you're going to do it. It all depends on the expertise of the implementation scientist and the team who will have to use their knowledge to address those issues. And now the most complex of the three, the, the classic theory, a proper theory, because it has a wonderful architecture, it brings so many things together, it's very embedded in broader sociological knowledge, and this is normalization process theory. Uh, it deserves a series of lectures. It's extremely uh, well-crafted, shall we say, very complex. But the main uh, essence of it, I would say, is that in order to make sure that intervention is implemented, uh, you need to have it embedded 
in the local organizational context. It has to fit with the way people work. And uh, as you can see, it has multiple components, four components, each of which is later subdivided. But each component here is focusing on a mechanism. What is the action that is required in order to ensure normalization, that is implementation? And here we have things that are both cognitive, so happen in your mind, and also things that are very practical and embedded in your actual action. A very important thing about normalization process theory is that it emphasizes the collective nature of implementation. Unless you have a team that thinks and works together, implementation will not lead to successful embeddedness of an intervention. And I think this is a very important strength of this theory because a lot of thinking in implementation science is historically about behavior change and individual focused interventions, while very many problems in real healthcare are not down to individual change. They are all down to organizational structures and how these constrain uh, professionals doing their job. Uh, there is a link here, and if so, if anyone is interested in that, I suggest you go to the website and read about each of the components here and look at what uh, they can of. So as I said, in summary, this is an example of a classic theory. It, it, it explains how and why implementation happens, not what it includes uh, and or in what sequence it unfolds. It draws attention to mechanisms. Mechanisms are very important for any thinking about implementation. And if you look, it's not just about mechanism because it also shows you certain determinants and it also shows you processes because obviously thinking about implementation, making sense of it, which the authors label as coherence, they usually precede the actual shared collective implementation and monitoring and evaluation. Okay, so these are our three types of theories. And from here, I will proceed to briefly talking about implementation strategies. You have already seen this slide is quite similar to what Paul showed to you. And the main thing here is to emphasize that there are a lot of strategies. In the real world, however, uh, we need to mention that there are multiple contextual barriers very often happening at the same time. Very often, most often, I would say, one strategy is not enough to ensure implementation. So multiple strategies, they need to be used concurrently in the same implementation intervention. That's why we talk about complex implementation interventions. And the nice graph that Paul showed uh, from a BMJ paper on process evaluation, I think it brilliantly captures the complexity of things that you need to look into when you deal with those interventions, whether you assess their effectiveness or just try to understand how they work or why don't they work. In general, if you start digging into the literature about uh, every strategy, you will be likely to find a lot of recommendations uh, about how to actually implement them and how to optimize their effectiveness. However, I keep saying that the devil is in the detail. And Paul mentioned that unfortunately, very often when you read implementation science studies, when you start reading about a description of a strategy, you will realize that the authors don't normally provide enough information. So often it's very difficult to say what distinguishes a successful strategy from an unsuccessful one, because on the surface, the principles can look very similar. Uh, that's why we encourage everyone when writing up implementation studies to pay a lot of attention to how they describe strategies. And also, when people engage with the literature, it's not enough to read one seminal paper about a framework, because most useful knowledge will actually come in subsequent papers on the same uh, topic, which are written either by the same team or maybe different teams, where they actually try and make sense of their theory using empirical data. So in order to use implementation science tools, it's important to look at the whole history, starting from the seminal framework towards its systematic reviews, 
and other research studies informed by it. Now I suggest that we zoom in a little bit on one strategy, very briefly, just in to, to emphasize how complex things are. And we will be talking about facilitation, where you have people trained as facilitators coming into organizational setting and helping people there to implement stuff. So uh, I will draw on four papers here. This paper showed the facilitation as an intervention is not effective. So the trial gave negative results. Then the brilliant authors who I deeply respect and with whom I work wrote two further papers to explain why it happened and also to explain under what circumstances and in what settings facilitation can actually work. And then I will draw a little bit on my own paper, which is very descriptive, very theoretical. It's about how facilitation changes over time. And I will show you a couple of pictures uh, to illustrate. So for my own uh, study, what can the real, real world implementation intervention centered on facilitation look like? These are the four components of any facilitation initiative if done properly. It enables a person doing facilitation, a set of goals, a team, and also a very strong emphasis on learning. If you have them, that is facilitation. These are four components. But in the project that I was taking part in, in addition to that, facilitators appropriately used other methods. For example, they used audit and feedback supported by an IP tool. They looked at PDSA cycles, which are very popular in improvement. They looked at financial incentives. Uh, they used printed material. They worked with local opinion leaders. So this is a complex intervention. Uh, it's a bit of a digression, but what happened over time is that the core components got replaced by some of the peripheral and facilitation actually stopped being facilitation. But that's a different question about to what extent can we adapt our interventions to context. It's quite tricky. So in effect, when you do facilitation, it's all down to the facilitator. Again, to diagnose different levels of context, think about evidence, think about the holders and use a multiplicity of skills to address various things. Okay, now, question. If facilitation is not always successful, what does make it successful under certain conditions? Very importantly, you need to have a lot of contextual enablers, prioritization, leadership support, resources. If you don't have money to do it, you won't succeed. All these, if present, leads to collective engagement, ideally. Then you have facilitators with their own expertise who come into the equation. And then the process starts, and all this leads to constant learning. This learning also improves the skills and authority of facilitators, making them more experienced and empowering them. And only if these uh, mechanisms and enablers are sustained over time, then you will have a practical outcome in the form of practice change. If you do not have certain elements here, then the whole equation just doesn't work and facilitation is not successful. This is the real complexity. You need to have enablers, you have to have mechanisms, you have to have a theory of learning underlying everything. You need to have skillful people and then everything should be connected. Okay, I am almost finishing. So what I want to say is that implementation science gives a range of brilliant tools, but most importantly, it's not about tools, it's about a different way of thinking about implementation. And I will try to summarize, both drawing on Paul's slides and on my own, about what, what things this way of thinking includes. So you have theories, models, and frameworks, but they will not give you prescriptions. I already said that. They will make you think. And when you think, you have to start with diagnosing different elements of context, uh, identifying enablers and barriers, very hard work, selecting a wide range of implementation strategies to target this enablers and barriers. And as I said, if the problem is not at the psychological level, it's not very useful to use behavior change implementation interventions. You need to think about groups or organizations. 
So implementation science is a multidisciplinary field and there are many subspecialties almost. So it's always important to think what kind of implementation scientist do you need to have on your team? Uh, and even more difficult task is to combine multiple strategies into one complex intervention and then also keep tailoring it. And there was a question on the chat about pragmatic design, pragmatic trials. Actually, pragmatic trial ideally would probably enable this kind of tailoring throughout the trial. But if I'm wrong, Paul might come back to that later. Uh, and again, as Paul said before, how and why is extremely important. In implementation science, we do not stop just saying whether intervention works or not. It's not just about effectiveness. It's about what makes this intervention effective, what mechanisms. And then we ideally can extrapolate those mechanisms to new settings. When can this thinking be applied? Well, very often, most often actually, when I get approached about implementation, it's when an innovation is already you know, an existing package, it's already there and now it's time to implement. My answer then is usually better late than never. But of course, if your product is ready, it's very difficult to change it and to adapt it. Uh, very often also, especially in the context of grant application, we think about implementation in parallel with effectiveness studies. So very often we have an implementation package uh, process evaluation, which is attached to a clinical trial. And the benefit of doing it is that while you are actually undertaking your trial, you will already collect information about what and how you can do to make the intervention implementable down the line, especially at the scale up and roll out stage. But ideally, I would say, always think about implementation science early, while you're just developing your initial thoughts and think about all the people who will be involved in using and implementing it. Users, clinicians, commissioners, because their input is very, very important. And now this is my final slide. In the beginning, I showed you a picture of a bridge and asked you whether implementation science is really a bridge. And after this talk, I think my conclusion would be is that implementation science provides building blocks for building a very specific tailored bridge for your specific project, for your specific RIBA, which you will build together with your team members. But the bridge doesn't exist on its own. You have to work on it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, both of you. I, I hope everyone agrees with me that we, what we've had there are two really good introductions and in fact, to some depth, which is quite amazing in 20 minutes each. Uh, of implementation science. So I really do appreciate that. Feel free, free to put your uh, videos on people, but just keep muted for now. Um, so we've got quite a few questions and we had some submitted before uh, the talks began. So I'm gonna start with um, one of those, which, which was quite interesting. Um, and our speakers were interested in it too, which helps. So what implementation science frameworks or theories would you recommend for implementing digital interventions in health and social care? That will, who, who wants to take that, Paul? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll go first. So um, as Romans alluded to, there are uh, numerous frameworks and theories out there. Um, the ones we see in the literature related to e-health interventions most regularly are the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research and Normalization Process Theory, both of which look at um, the integration of uh, new innovations in, in, given, in given contexts, and they're often used together. Now, if anybody is particularly interested in how those are operationalized in the context of digital health, there are systematic reviews out there. Uh, a lot of the early development work for normalization process theory was done in digital health interventions. So uh, again, that's a uh, review. Yeah, Carl May would be the author of that. And there is also um, uh, systematic reviews on uh, the application of um, uh, CIFR in e-health contexts, which covers more than digital health, but uh, including sort of telemedicine and so forth. So I think um, that would be my place to, to, to go. I don't know if Roman wants to add anything to that. Well, I totally agree. And uh, as I said before, it's less important about what framework you use, it's more about how you apply it. And I think the only thing to add is that very often it's beneficial to combine two frameworks. You can use CIFA, for example, for determinants, 
and normalization process theory for mechanisms. They work quite well together. And I think there is even a paper outlining how they're combined. Okay, that's, that's a great and comprehensive answer. We'll try and make the answers a little bit briefer now because we may overrun by five minutes, but there are quite a few questions. So let's just see how we go. Um, Corinne asked about pragmatic clinical trial designs for evaluating strategies, but you've kind of covered that, I think, haven't you? Um, do you want to add yeah. anything to what you said? Just that implementation strategies are applied in clinical contexts. So invariably, most of the, uh, nearly all the studies that are done are uh, pragmatic trials. Great. There was a question from Mona about it, it, whether we know um, what percentage uh, or how likely, what's the probability that, uh, that guidelines on their own will change practice, doctor's practice, this specifically says. So on their own, just um, the, the, there are systematic reviews on printed educational materials, so guidelines, uh, small to moderate effects, but th there are a few caveats to that, and that would be if it's a clear simple message so something that's easily be actionable in practice and there's a general consensus that that's the right thing to do so on its own if that's the only thing you were to do that's the the, the level of uptake and when i say small to moderate we're sort of saying five to ten percent uh, in terms of improvements over time great um so kevin's asked a, asked a really good question about whether you've got an example of an effectiveness study where you identify barriers and facilitators and use that knowledge to develop a successful implementation strategy? That is a good question. <laughs> you or anyone you know of? Has anything you've done been successful, Paul? No, all, all my stuff's negative. Um, yeah, I... I uh, go on to another question, I'll come back to Kevin. I might have to send Kevin a longer answer, actually. <laughs> Okay, and uh, Michelle Harvey asked, asked a question which I think you've kind of covered uh, that you may want to come back and add a bit more. If you've got an intervention, if you've got an intervention that's been effic efficacious in an RCT, can you go on and look at um, implementation and effectiveness in the same study beyond that? And you've, you've already said yes with your process evaluation and your hybrid yeah. designs. Do you want to add anything or give it? No, I think that's, that, that is very much a, a, a sort of um, shift in the field in that hybrids. If you look at the North American literature, it's rare to see a, a design that isn't a hybrid design now. So I think uh, there's a, there are reasons why the UK and Europe may not uh, have um, gone down that route so quickly, but uh, I think that's that's the way of the world that we're, we're moving towards is uh, concurrent um, evaluation. Do you want to do you want to come back on? Have you got any more thoughts for Kevin, or shall I? Shall we move on and pretend that question was never asked? Well, I, actually, um, uh, Kevin's own uh, trial that he's just got funded, uh, the famous trial, would be uh, an example. Um, so, you know, uh, Kevin, you, if you want to refer back to your own... Uh, yeah, that's not happened yet, though, has it? That's no, happened. but tri trial and process evaluation, that, that would be a good... If it all goes to, to, to plan, then that would be a, a, a good example. Great. Um, somebody sent in a question about the relationship, the relationship between governance arrangements around Q, uh, quality improvement and innovation. I'm not quite sure what that question means and it was submitted online so I'm not really sure um, I, I mean have you encountered any particular governance challenges around trying to do your studies no more than others maybe not particularly I mean I, it, the, no more than anybody else uh, traditionally our ethics because we're targeting health professionals in the main or policy makers you know we don't really interact with um, patients and implementation science studies um, so traditionally it should be low risk, but actually the way that plays out in ethics uh, uh, processes is the same for everybody else. So, you know, it's not that like there's any um, magic. Uh, magic bullet there, I'm afraid. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, somebody's asked what, trials design, what trial designs work best to show the impact of complex behavioural interventions in primary care settings? Well, the feature in the field would be cl cluster trials and whether they're the most efficient or effective way to do that, that's um, uh, uh, open to uh, debate. But I think um, 
for complex behavioral interventions, I would say you can't do a, a trial without uh, a, an embedded process evaluation to understand what's going on because it's a complex intervention. So all those moving parts that you're um, uh, releasing into the into the wild, so to speak, you, you need to understand what's going on. And I think that historically was a problem where people just did effectiveness trials in very much the um, uh, traditional sense. But I think uh, process evaluations um, are, are key to any sort of uh, evaluation of a complex intervention. Thank you. So uh, a question from me. I think we're increasingly um, becoming uh, invested in the idea that we need to think much more about commissioning much earlier in our research process. So um, we need to we need to you know often be discussing with commissioners um, whether this is something they are likely to fund if they are, if they are going to commission something what is the kind of evidence that they would require to help support that decision making and I know you've worked with commissioners in the past Paul and I just wonder if you've got any reflections on your learning from that previous work and, and the research that's been done that might influence how we go about things in Greater Manchester to work more as a joined up system, thinking about things earlier on. Well, the, the, the first thing, and this is something that Roman alluded to in his slides as well, is that um, you know collective action. So if you're wanting to bring about change in something, then you have to engage with the people who are involved in that process. And commissioners as the funders and resources of services are, uh, are key to all that. So the, the more engagement uh, that you can have, uh, the better. And certainly the, the work that I've done in the past, that has been about um, trying to answer questions uh, questions that are derived from the commissioners themselves so the things that they are interested in are the things that they're wanting to yeah. implement and bring about uh, changes within their their own locality are the things that we try and address through um, uh, the studies that we undertake now that can be quite a long drawn out process and I think it's about you know you're establishing relationships for the longer term so that um, you can undertake uh, studies over time it's not something that you can just you know walk in one day and yeah. design and evaluate the next these conversations are ongoing conversations and it may be that there's sometimes there's an element of serendipity about something that they want to do which uh, matches with the skills and time and resources that you have and i think that's one of the roles that um arcs around the country can play is about um, making sure that we engage fully with um, those uh, uh, people in CCGs and uh, even at a, a more regional level um, from, from a commissioning perspective. That's a great answer. And that's not traditionally how academics have worked, is it? So that's a, a thing that we're all um, learning. Very yeah, fast. and it's, it's hard. I mean, that's the other yeah, thing. It's not time consuming. Yeah. But the gains are huge if it means that we can then get impact from our research much more readily because people have bought into it and we were doing the right research in the first place. I mean, the gains are huge. Um, more questions are coming in now and I know we're going to finish really shortly, so short answers and I'll shut up. Are there any exemplars of local implementation of new healthcare workforce modelling from Marie Kerwin? Uh, that I don't know would be the short answer. Yeah. No, I'm not sure either, but it's an important topic. Um, yes, um, Natalie uh, from Salford makes a very important point about um, using your local research infrastructure in your local NHS um, to get support with uh, governance and ethics and all those kinds of things. Involve them from the beginning. That's really important. Hayley Lowther says, asks, how can patient and public involvement be embedded in implementation science? Another great question. Yeah, and that, that is an ongoing issue within, within the field. Um, in, the, in the States, it's playing out in terms of equity. Uh, so everything you've seen uh, uh, Joe Biden talking about in the, the last 24 hours is very much a focus of a lot of implementation science at the moment so engaging with the communities in which you're trying to bring about change is is key uh, historically it's not been done well but that's no reason why it can't be done better in the future and again this is where the expertise of ppie um, uh, individuals you know we've got uh, a great team in the arc you know consulting as natalie would say with ethics the same applies to ppi it's engaging that early in the design process to make sure that you are uh, actually uh, involving audiences, uh, the, the end users, the end recipients of care. 
Thanks, and sorry, I've been very remiss in my chairing of this because I should have made much more effort to bring Roman in to answer any of those questions as well. Is there anything you want to add on any of that stuff, Roman? Well, I, th I think Paul has given a very, very um, brief and spot on answer. So it's really difficult to chip in because everything is just perfectly answered. In terms of PPO, I think historically implementation science was very much on the Paul side. The ethos is we have a brilliant piece of evidence, it works, we know it works, and we will implement it on to you. And I think PPI comes from a different perspective, where you're supposed to be on consultation with your users quite early on. And I think this is exactly why it is quite difficult for implementation scientists to switch their understanding and to be more receptive to the push side, to the uh, patient side, but I think this is work in progress and it's already happening. And talking about, about um, uh, other stakeholders, commissioners, from my personal experience, I think, again, two main things. You need to understand what makes them tick and what makes them tick is totally different from makes researchers tick. It's not about the strength of evidence, unfortunately. They don't really care about it. They care about how they can construct a narrative about how great they are for addressing policy agenda. And the other thing is that they have very limited um, attention span, very limited. They have attention span of two slides max. I hope we've got some commissioners in the audience who are going to come back at some of this. No, no. Carry on. The, <laughs> carry on. Totally digging. fine. Because the main thing here is in when you present whatever evidence you have or promise of evidence, it has to be done very briefly in a very concise manner with uh, lots and lots of graphs, pictures and other things that will capture that attention. Yeah, but if we've co-produced it with them in the first place, then it's win-win, isn't it? I think, and much, and much quicker. So, uh, so I can't see any hands raised and we're just about a minute over time. I'm gonna leave you, Roman, with the last question, which is a killer question for everyone to, to end with, which is what are your take home tips for all our delegates today? Where can they go for further support and resources? Well, of course, you have implementation expertise in the ARC, and we'll be more than happy with Paul to uh, answer some of your questions and maybe point you towards people with expertise. And I would also like to emphasize that we are very lucky in this uh, region to have Health Innovation Manchester, which is specifically focusing on supporting researchers who want to have their innovations implemented across Greater Manchester. So I think not everyone is aware that they exist. And they're absolutely brilliant and they do a lot of work in this direction. That's a very good answer. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, um, yes, yes, the ARC. I think, I think it's also fair to say that there is a dearth of implementation specialists and scientists out there and that, you know, there's a real lack of capacity. So the more that we can develop and the more we can clone you to, um, the better. And I think we, we do need to get better and it is on our to-do list in the ARC of providing some resources that people can go to easily to pick up and, and use and, uh, when they're planning their implementation strategies rather than, you know, asking um, you to all the time. So, so <laughs> you'll never get any work done. So, um, it, so that just remains for me to, um, Thank you all for your participation. Uh, it's been a great discussion. I think our speakers have done a really, really good job. And just ask you to make sure that you know when the next mask seminars are and that you sign up and, and come along to the next one. So um, hopefully I've done everything I'm supposed to have done. Give me a nod, Jane, have I? <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.